It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor, coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. I kept seeing these advertisements everywhere, free credit report. And uh, I was just mildly curious about what that involved. Praise the Lord, uh, we paid off our home loan not too long ago and our cars are paid off and so I didn't need any credit. I thought my credit was perfect. A matter of fact, I don't think a week goes by when we don't get half a dozen applications in the mail of somebody that wants us to get one more credit card. And uh, so some of you might need an extra one. We got lots of them at our house, <laughs> applications. But I was curious, and then I saw something on the Internet that said that these credit reporting agencies are required to give you one free credit report a year. And so I thought, well, I may as well find out. I'm curious. I thought, well, I probably have stellar credit and uh, industrial strength, good credit. So I, uh, I sent off for one of these free credit reports. And uh, it was pretty good, but it wasn't perfect. And that really bothered me. And I thought, what in the world happened? And I found out, yeah, Karen, I guess, gave the wrong address to a doctor or something. I don't know what happened. But some, some doctor that we went to, we gave them the wrong address, and they kept sending the bill to the wrong address, and the people there didn't want to pay it. We don't know who they were. And so they turned it over to a credit agency. We got that taken care of, and everything's okie-dokie. But just in that interval that the bill wasn't paid, it blemished our credit. And I guess to try and fix that, here we're making credit confessions right now, I guess to try and fix that takes an act of Congress because once your credit is besmirched, you are flagged for life, evidently. Well, I'm not worried about it right now because I'm not trying to borrow any money. But uh, some people are, and... I guess they've got this whole very elaborate system right now where everything you borrow and your payment schedule and uh, your bills that you pay and if you're late, somebody out there is keeping tabs on everything. It's all this electronic world that we live in right now, having perfect credit, that's uh, questionable. Well, I want you to know God has perfect credit. Yeah. And the title of our message today is God Said It, and that's, of course, part of a saying that we've said before, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Have you heard that before? Why don't you say that with me? God said it, I believe it, that settles it. There are some songs that uh, also bear that out. Well, God has a perfect credit score, I want you to know. In the Bible, it tells us that his promises never fail. Now, right now, we're, we've got uh, an epidemic of failed promises in the country and credit issues because of the financial crunch. Some people are losing their homes. They signed covenants to make payments that they can't make. Or they went to buy a car and they're being repossessed. We look around and we see an epidemic of failed marriages. You wonder, can you trust anybody's word these days? Does a promise still mean what it says? I want you to know when God says something, He never fails. His record is perfect in keeping His word. Now I'm going to cover a lot of Scripture with you today. And the goal of my message today is, of course, to get you to read your Bible more and to get you to believe it more and to cash in on the promises in God's word. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, Moses said, God is not a man that he should lie. God can't lie. Nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Why would God make a promise he couldn't keep? Why would he do that? 
He doesn't have to promise anything to anybody, does he? Sometimes we'll make a promise to somebody because we're in trouble or we're afraid, promise that we can't keep. But God's never threatened with that, so why would he ever make a promise he couldn't keep? Does that make sense? Everything he said he will do. Joshua chapter 23, 14. You just might jot some of these down and look them up later. And gain some encouragement. When the Lord brought the children of Israel into the promised land and Joshua was becoming an old man, one of his last assemblies before the people, he made a statement to the folks. Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. He says, I'm getting old, I'm going to die. I'm going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not, I've underlined this, not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. God has spoken good things concerning you. And the promises that he made for the children of Israel, not one thing failed of everything that he promised. All has come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. So how good is God's credit report? Perfect, but I'm not done yet. 1 Kings 8, 55 and 56. Here when Solomon dedicated the temple, we just did a whole series on Solomon, and he blessed the people. He stood and he blessed the congregation of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed be the Lord that has given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise which he has promised by the hand of Moses his servant. Not one word. Perfect record. God keeps his promises. He never fails. And yet, we fail to capitalize on his promises. Matthew 24, Jesus said in verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. Oh Lord, you said you're coming back. Where are you? Has his promise failed? Well, he promised to come the first time he did. It was 4,000 years, but he did. He promised to come again. It's just now about 2,000 years. I think he's just about to come. Everything God says will happen. The world might forget his word. He doesn't measure time the way we do. It never fails. Everything God says happens. Psalm 89, 34. We sometimes break our promises, break our covenants. God does not. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands for how long? Forever. God's word never fails. It is eternal. Jesus said, Who is going to survive the, the storm that is coming? He that hears these words of mine and does them, he's like the man building on a rock. It will not move. It will not fail. You can trust the word of God. Before I go too far, maybe I should just simply define what is a promise. According to the American Heritage Dictionary, a promise is a solemn declaration assuring that one will or will not do something a vow, a covenant, a pledge to swear or commit oneself to a promise to do or to give. An indication of something favorable to come. Expectation comes from the Latin word prometir, or pro means forth, metir, to send, to send forth. It's something that you're sending on ahead, a guarantee. Now, one reason God cannot lie is because he's God and he's perfect. He's also a king and a king cannot break his word. I can think of a couple of examples in the Bible of kings that spoke, earthly kings, that then regretted what they said and maybe wanted to change it, and they couldn't. You remember when King Darius signed a law that if you prayed to any god or man except him for 30 days, you went to the lion's den. And then Daniel was brought before him because Daniel prayed three times a day publicly. And the king was sore displeased with himself. He wanted to change what he had said, but a king's word is law. And the law of the Medes and Persians could not be altered. It could not be changed. It was a firm decree. Ahasuerus made a law that all the Jews should be attacked on a certain day. Then he found that his wife was a Jew, Esther. And he could not take back that law. All he could do is make another law, giving them the right to defend themselves in advance. 
who was it? Uh, Herod spoke and promised that whatever Salome wanted, if she danced up to half his kingdom, he'd give it. She then said, I want the head of John the Baptist. But because the king had spoken and his word was law, he could not break his promise. Now these are vacillating, weak, indecisive, earthly, sinful kings that would not alter their word. Do we think that God is going to alter his? Heard a story one time about a, a man who was brought before the king and he had been condemned and sentenced to die by beheading. And as he heard the judgment, he began to tremble. And the king said, well, we'll give you one final wish. He said, can I have a drink of water? And they brought the man a porcelain cup and he took it in his hands and he was shaking and the water was sloshing around. And the king felt sorry for the man. He said, look, you're safe until that water is drunk. You don't have nothing to fear. You will not die until that water is drunk. So relax, drink your water. And the king heard, or the man heard what the king said, and he tossed the cup down, and it crashed on the floor. And he says, you promised I would not die until that water was drunk. And the king kind of gave him a wiry smile and said, very clever. He says, my word is law. You're free to go. <laughs> he never drank that water, could he? <laughs> Can we trust God to keep his political promises? Amen. Will God keep his word? And yet we are so slow to take God at his word. A promise is a promise. Now we as people should realize that promises should be kept. I'm not saying because he's God, he keeps his promises. We don't have to keep ours. We should keep ours. You know, we've all heard about honest Abe. And uh, we heard the story about one time that he realized he was given five cents too much change when he got home from the country store. And he walked 10 miles back one way, 20 miles round trip to bring a nickel back uh, because he just couldn't keep someone else's money. And it bothered him. One time Lincoln was riding along in a buggy with a general who offered him a swig of his whiskey. It was a cold day. Lincoln said, said, thank you, no. And uh, he said, well, would you like a cigar? I've got an extra. And he pulled one out, uh, offered it to the president. And the president said, no, I, I made a promise and uh, I don't drink or smoke. He said, you made a promise. He said, well, here's how, here's how it happened, general. He said, uh, I was nine years old. My mother called me to her side. She was sick and dying. She said, Abe, I want you to make me a promise right now that you'll always keep promise that you will never use alcohol or tobacco. said, I promise, Mama. said, and then she died. said, I made a promise, and I've never broken it. And the general said to the president, I would never encourage you to break that promise. And he said, I wish I had made a similar promise to my mother. I would have been a lot better off. But uh, that's something that I think we could all learn from. That promise that he had made to his mother, he realized was something that was going to last the rest of his life. Sometimes we make promises in haste, and you say, oh, well, you know, I was weak, and so I made a promise, and I didn't really mean to keep it. The Bible tells us better not to make a promise, Ecclesiastes 5.5, 5, than to make it and not keep it. Better it is that you should not vow than that you vow and not pay. In uh, Deuteronomy 23, verse 21, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you. But if you abstain from vowing it, shall it not be a sin to you? That which is gone from your lips you shall keep and perform. We need to keep our vows. That would be our promises to one another. I think that Christians should be very careful about filing bankruptcy. I uh, remember reading the history of Mark Twain. He was very successful as a writer. And at one point when he was in the glory, his golden years of writing, he was a very wealthy man. His books were selling all across the country, Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer and others. And, and he had become very successful, very wealthy. And then he went into the printing business, which was a big mistake. Figure out what you're good at and stick to it. He was a good writer. He was not a good printer. And he invested thousands and thousands of dollars in this automated typesetting machine. Back then, remember, they used to set type by hand. 
And some guy had come to Mark Twain and said, I've got a machine that I've invented that will automatically set type. All the papers will buy it. All the publishers will buy it. And Twain thought this would be a good investment. So he poured all of his money into this automated typesetting machine and they could, the thing was extremely complicated. They could never get it to work and they kept needing a little more time, a little more tweaking and then they couldn't sell it because it kept breaking down. And basically he lost his entire fortune and was totally broke. Had no money for his family and here, I mean, they had, all they had left was a home and he had to go to a friend that loved his books to invest in uh, trying to pay to keep his house. Twain lost everything. He didn't want to file bankruptcy because he thought, look, I've made promises to pay these debts and uh, I want to pay them. So his friend that had lent the money to help him keep his house, he said, you need to go on the road, do what you're good at. Do your lectures, write, keep on writing. And he went on a world tour. And during that world tour, he went to India, he went to England, he went to Australia, he sailed around the world going everywhere he could go to try and work to pay off his debts. He was already old enough to retire when this happened. And he did. He finally paid off all his debts and he ended up again with enough wealth that he could uh, retire and live out his days. But he would not give up and just say, oh well, I'm not going to pay. Because that was back in the days when a person's word meant something. Well, God wants us to keep our promises. Psalm 15, verse 1 and verse 4, by the way, would you like to know who's going to heaven? Those that believe the promises of God and those that keep their promises. You hear that? That would mean your marriage vows, baptismal vows. Now, Lord, who will abide in your tabernacle and who will dwell in your holy hill? He that swears to his own hurt and changeth not. That means someone who makes a promise, you buy something and say, I'm going to pay for it, and then you can't. You ought to just to say, oh, well, I tried, and throw your hands in the air. We need to keep our promises. He who swears to his own hurt and changeth not, like Twain. If you've got to go around the world on a speaking tour and write until your fingers are raw, you do it, and you pay back your debts. I heard about a man in France, an attorney, and uh, there was a 90-year-old woman that lived in an apartment that he realized had a good location and he wanted the apartment and, and uh, he asked to buy it from her and she said, well, where am I going to live? He says, look, I'll make you a deal. He said, uh, you're 90 years old. She said, uh, if you'll sell me this apartment when you die, sell it to me right now, I'll buy it. He says, I will pay the rent, I'll pay your payments, for the rest of the, your life until you pass away. You know, banks are doing that now. They call it a reverse mortgage. So she said, okay. She was 91. He had no idea she would live to be France's oldest woman. <laughs> Jean Calment lived to 121. <laughs> the attorney died before she did. His family needed to keep paying her rent for 30 years beyond her 91st birthday. <laughs> Who would have thunk, right? <laughs> that would have happened that way. But they kept their promise. Got to be careful what you promise. Someone once said, he who is slow in making a promise is more likely to fulfill it or to be faithful in the performance of it. Don't make promises quickly. Take them seriously if you're going to make it. Oswald Chambers said, it's better to run the risk of being considered indecisive than to promise and not fulfill. Take your time. Now, when God makes a promise, we can count on it that He is going to keep His promise. He never files bankruptcy. He never gives up. No, sometimes man has broke his promise to God. Some of those things are conditional, but God will never break his promise to us. And when we fail to believe in his promises, our unbelief insults God. Deuteronomy 1 verse 32, after the Lord did all he did to bring them out of Egypt, they wouldn't believe that he could bring them into the promised land. Yet for all that you did not believe the Lord your God who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents, 
to show you the way you should go. There they had the pillar of fire guiding them through the desert. In a fire by night and a cloud by day. And the Lord heard the sound of your words and was angry. And he took an oath saying, Surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see that good land of which I swore to give their fathers. When he brought them to the borders of the promised land and those spies went and looked things over and came back, ten of the spies said, you know, we're not so sure we can believe that he's going to give us the promised land. Why was the promised land called the promised land? Because he promised to give it to them. And so when they came back and said, we're not sure he can do what he's promised, and the Lord said, okay then, if you don't believe my promises, you will not be in the promised land. Now there's a very simple lesson there for us. How many of you want to get to the heavenly Canaan promised land? You must believe. Without faith it's impossible to please God. You must believe He can do what He's promised. And if I were to ask you right now, how many of you believe that He has a mansion He's preparing for you in heaven? I think every hand would go up. I believe the promises of God. But if I were to say, how many of you believe that He can give you victory over sin? You know why? Because we failed so many times. We think, well, but I believe God, but I don't believe in myself. This is probably the most important place for us to trust His promise and how it plays out in your victory. Because, you know, we're real long on believing that God can do what He can do outside of what He does in us probably the most important place for us to realize trust and faith in God is not that he can part oceans out there and rain fire and brimstone down on the enemies, but do you believe he can keep his promise about giving you a new heart? Do you believe he can keep his promise about keeping you from falling? Oh, come on. Let me hear an amen. Better than that. <laughs> Even if you have to manufacture that amen, you ought to do it because it might influence your own heart. Our unbelief insults him. When Israel stopped believing in the promises of God, they lost the promised land. Hebrews 3, verse 19, also going over into chapter 4, verse 1. So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. That's still true today, friends. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, it's not just talking about the Sabbath rest here. It's talking about entering the rest of the promised land, entering the rest of Jesus. Come unto me and I'll give you rest. A promise remains of entering his rest. Let us fear. Fear what? Fear that we will not believe. Let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it, that we fall after the same pattern of unbelief. Romans 4.21 and being fully convinced that what he has promised he was also able, able to perform. Do you really believe that he can do what he says he can do? So, how do we cash in on the promises of God? How do we finally get to where we can realize the promises of God? You've heard me mention before that uh, one of the great gimmicks companies take advantage of during the holiday season is gift cards. People are given gift cards at restaurants or they're given gift cards. I feel sorry for you if you've got a gift card to uh, Circuit City now. They're going out of business. And people get gift cards and sometimes they'll take it to the store and you know it's got $50 on it but they only spend $30 and they come back with 20 and they forget how much is on this card and they lose track of it. And it's a fact that these companies make a big profit selling gift cards because many people forget to even use them or they don't use them all and it turns into almost 50% profit just to sell the card. They're unused. Promises in God's Word are a lot more unused than gift cards. There are so many promises here that people just do not take advantage of that are available. So how do we cash in on His promises? God's promises become effective when we read about them, accept them as our own, and appropriate them for ourselves. Someone once said, tarry at the promise till God meets you there. He always returns by way of His promises. You can track the Lord through history by His promises. His actions are always following 
His promises. And so often there are promises of God that are just not experienced or realized because we don't read them and then we don't wrap ourselves around them. You won't enjoy it unless you see it. Everything is the Word of God is everything. But the Word comes alive in our minds and hearts. It must be seen, it must be heard, it must be believed and embraced, and then it happens. Wonderful things happen when we believe the Word of God. Some of you remember uh, a famous uh, pastor within our denomination, Glenn Kuhn, who did these seminars on the ABCs of prayer. And he talked about how important it was, ABCs being ask, believe, and claim. And that's really the same principles for experiencing a promise coming alive for you in the Bible. Read it, say, I believe it, and then embrace it and say, all right, Lord, I'm going to thank you for this. I claim this promise. Sometimes you basically have to present it to the Lord. The promises of God are like stars. The darker the night, the brighter they are. God's promises are an inexhaustible mine filled with wealth. Hebrews 11.33, how did the, the winners in the Bible win? Who through faith, they subdued kingdoms, they wrought righteousness, they obtained promises. How did they get these promises? Through faith, they embraced the promises, and that's how they stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness they were made strong. They waxed valiant in fight. They turned to flight the armies of the enemies. Now, I notice that part there where it says, stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of the fire. You know, there are psalms that talk about victory over lions. Daniel probably knew those psalms that David wrote, don't you think? And I think it encouraged him. There is a promise that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have read in Isaiah. Let me tell you what it is. Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Neither will the flame kindle upon thee. And I believe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego read that verse. They probably learned it at their mother's knee. And when Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace, the Holy Spirit reminded them of that promise. They claimed that promise. And they said, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from your hand, O king. And did God honor his word? I can just see it now as the soldiers were tying up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were probably muttering to each other, remember the promise, Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 2. When you go through the fire, it will not burn you. Okay, Lord, you hear that? You said it. And they presented it to the Lord. What could God do? The whole world would have to pass away before God becomes a liar. So they get tossed in the fire and he preserved them during that time. We're to pray in Jesus' name. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God are in Him. Yes. When you find a promise in God's Word, and you know, I don't even have time now. There are thousands of promises in the Word of God. I thought about making a list and it just kept getting bigger and bigger of what God has promised for you and me. We come to Him and we claim the promises, not that we deserve it, but in the name of His Son. Now, think about this for a second. If God cannot lie, if His Word is perfect and unfailing, and if you're asking Him to keep His Word because He said it, and to honor it because you now have the righteousness of His Son, how good is the righteousness of Jesus? What's His credit report? Perfect, perfect 100%. How dependable is God's Word? So if you approach the Father with the integrity of His Word, and you're asking him to honor his promise based on the righteousness of his son, and he promises to give that to you by asking, what are your chances of getting that promise answered? That's pretty good. I think it's 100%. Our part is to believe in his promises, to claim them. He's promised to give us his Holy Spirit. Did you know that? It's the most important need that anybody could ask for is the Spirit of God. Jesus said in Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endowed with power on high. This is a good example of how the principle works. 
He said, I'm going to give you the power of the Spirit to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Wait in Jerusalem till you receive what I promised. Did he tell them exactly when they'd receive it? No. Turns out they waited 10 days. Did they receive it? Yes. Does God keep his promises? They were to watch and pray for the Holy Spirit. That's what they did. They stayed in the upper room. They waited. And all that time they were waiting, they were preparing as they prayed. They didn't even know it, but they put aside their differences. They humbled themselves. They emptied themselves. They read the Bible. Their hearts were being prepared, and they were assembled together praying, and then suddenly the power came, the promise came of the Holy Spirit. He's promised the Spirit other times. Acts 2.38, Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you possibly might any of you know that verse? There is the uh, possibility you could. He says, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is unto you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. In other words, whosoever. Be baptized, call on the name of the Lord, the criteria of baptism and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit just as when Jesus was baptized part of that was the Holy Spirit came down to prepare him for a life of holiness and ministry God will do that for you and I just wonder how many people have been baptized and they've never received the Holy Spirit because they went through the baptism part but they never went through the claiming of the Holy Spirit praying and asking to receive the Holy Spirit part and I think especially in our church go to a Pentecostal church, they don't ever leave out the Holy Spirit part. But in our church, we just want to make sure it's by immersion. Baptists also want to make sure we're doing it the right way, but we forget about the most important part. You not only need to be born of the water, you need to be born of the Spirit. I wonder if it's too late to ask for that or do you have to go get baptized again? Does God sometimes send the Holy Spirit even after the baptism? He can even pour out the Holy Spirit before you get baptized, like with Cornelius. So if you're still waiting to receive the Holy Spirit, maybe God's been waiting for you to ask for the promise. And you need to claim it. He can still give it to you again. If you want to get rebaptized, that might be possible too, but I don't want to cause a mass rebaptism here. Because the Bible tells us the disciples received the baptism of the Holy Spirit after their water baptism when they learned to claim the promise. Amen? Ephesians 1.13, still talking about the Holy Spirit. In Him you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I love this verse because it talks about you trusted the Holy Spirit, promise, and it says you are sealed. You know, it used to be that Years ago, if you bought a piece of land, I'm talking back in the 1400s, they would cut a piece of sod from that land and give it to you. And that was a token that you now own that land. Or if you bought an orchard, the farmer that you bought the orchard from would break off a twig of that tree and give it to you, and it meant you now own the fruit of that orchard. It's yours. You bought a house, they used to take some of the, the thatch from the roof and they tear it off and put it in your hands, and that was a token that meant you now own the house. There is a token that God gives us that we have eternal life. That token is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the evidence. Does God give the Holy Spirit? Does He pour the Holy Spirit on people that are lost? Or does He give the Holy Spirit to His children? See, His gift is for His heirs. The Holy Spirit is a gift of the Spirit for those who are heirs of everlasting life. And so when He gives you the Spirit, that will encourage you that, hey, I've got a token of His promise that He'll save me. That's what it says. It says, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. God keeps up with His promises. You know, another promise some of us will enjoy, you might jot this down, he wants to promise to save our children. You know, I think it's, we, we want assurance of our salvation, but for those who are parents, if you could choose between assurance of your salvation and assurance of your children's salvation, I'll tell you right now, I would much, I'll sleep better at night if I could be assured of their salvation. 
I would, that's what I want. I would like promises. I like the promises of my salvation. I like that kind of assurance. But if I had to choose between the two, I would want the assurance that he'll save them and hear my prayers in their behalf. Isaiah 43, I know a lot of parents out there know this one. Verse 5, fear not for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather them from the west. I'll say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And again, Isaiah 49, 25, but thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty will be taken and the prey of the terrible will be delivered. For I will contend with him who contends with you and I will save your children. You know, this is caveman theology, but it's probably worth sharing. I think God is so honored by our faith that sometimes he will keep a promise that we find in his Bible we maybe even misunderstand. I remember one time hearing a Native American pastor get up and he had no formal ed education. He was reading this verse in Psalms about, he said, my heart is fixed. And I, I don't know, I think the pastor had had heart surgery or something and, and he thought the word fixed there meant like repaired. It doesn't mean that. It means fixed means, it means settled, like when something is nailed in place. My heart is fixed upon God when you fix your vision on something. And so I heard him preaching this and I thought, he misunderstands the word, but I think God's going to heal him anyway because of his faith. He was taking it as a promise. I remember also hearing one of them preach about the book of Job, <laughs> J-O-B. <laughs> and it was a great message, but he kept saying, and Job did this and Job did that. Well, that's how you spell Job, right? <laughs> but uh, so I've seen people sometimes go through the Word of God and they maybe they see something in there and it really strikes them and they claim it and I think, you know, they're reading that out of context but I'm not going to tell them otherwise because I think the Lord's glad that they're finding a promise in there. And rather than have one of His children doubt His faithfulness, I think God will honor a promise that He didn't even make. But you think He did. He'd much rather... You know, have you ever had that happen with your kids? They're telling you you promised something. You don't remember ever promising it. But rather than them think that you're lying to them, you say, I don't remember that one, but all right. <laughs> rather than you doubt me. <laughs> well, if we're like that as earthly parents, I think God's that way too. And sometimes we might read something in His Word and you might misapply it, but you know what? He might be saying something just for you. I heard a story just this week about a family of missionaries. It was, I think, on the Hope Channel. A family of missionaries that went to the mission field in, was it uh, Indonesia? Somewhere that was just absolutely rife with cobras. And the family, as they got off the plane and they saw everything, they were kind of having second thoughts about doing mission work. And the father, when he stepped out of the van onto the ground in this new mission field, he put his foot right down on a cobra. Pulled it back in. They just arrived said to the family, don't unpack. We're not staying. But then he began to wonder, you know, they'd done all this planning and preparation and thinking about, you know, how am I going to tell everybody about my years of mission service when it only lasted 30 seconds? <laughs> and he said, well, well, let's pray about it. He said, but look, I don't want to endanger my family. There's cobras everywhere here. And he said, I just stepped on one. I don't want to lose my children. And God knows that. And so, Lord, I'm going to do something that's pretty reckless. I'm going to pray never done this before, and I'm going to put my thumb, thumb in my Bible, flip through my Bible, close my eyes, put my thumb in my Bible. If you want us to stay here, I need some definite assurances because I sure don't want to risk my children's life unless I know you want us here. So he flipped through the Bible, he put his thumb there, he opened the Bible, he moved his thumb, and it was Mark 16 where it says, you will tread on serpents. <laughs> Actually, that was Psalm 91. Mark 16 is another one on serpents. And he said, well, that settled it for them. So they stayed in the mission field. They were there. He said they killed nine cobras while we were there and nobody ever got bit. But uh, that's not the way God wants you to read your Bible. He promises us eternal life. How many of you would like to claim that promise? Yeah. Titus 1 verse 2, in hope of eternal life, 
which God that cannot lie promised. That ought to get you to take a deep breath way down in the lower lobes of your lungs there. A sigh of relief. God has promised eternal life and he cannot lie. So we don't need to worry about his promise. Question is, are you going to cash that one in? Are you going to have that gift card disappear somewhere in your piles of papers? You know, with the contracts of men, someone said once, the big print gives and the small print taketh away. <laughs> and so we're wondering, where's the fine print? Well, the fine print says, if you believe. All things are possible if you believe. If you're not there, if you're not in the promised land, it's because you didn't believe that he could give it to you. By the way, Joshua and Caleb did make it to the promised land among those spies because they did believe. Joshua, Caleb rather, said, let's go up at once for he is able to give us victory over the enemies of the land. 1 John 2, 25, and this is the promise that he's promised us, even eternal life. In case one witness is not enough, there's a second witness for you. He's promised eternal life. You want a third witness? Hebrews 9, 15, and for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant to those who are called that they might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Wow, God has promised to give us everlasting life. Oh, but I'm, I'm not good enough. Well, he promises to fix that too. He knows you're not good enough, but he promises to change your heart and prepare you. But I don't have enough faith. He promises to give you faith. Everything you need to be there, he's promised to provide all things if you believe him. Amen. Just believe him. Now, one of the ways of promises work is not that God forgets, but he wants you to remind him. Love likes being pursued. Now, when Jacob was wrestling with the Lord, God had made a promise to Jacob to bless his seed to do good unto him, even though he had lied to his father and lied to his brother and tried to steal the birthright, God said, I'll forgive you. You've repented. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Now he comes back into the promised land. He's been gone for 21 years. His brother's coming with an army, 400 men, to annihilate him. And uh, he wrestled in prayer. And when the angel appears, he tells the angel, for you said... I will surely treat you well. I will do good unto you and make your descendants like the sand of the sea that cannot be numbered for multitude. You've promised me something. Did God honor his promise? Jacob reminded him. When Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and all the people sinned with a golden calf and God said, get out of my way, Moses. I'm going to wipe them out. I'll make a great nation of you. God knew what he was going to do. He was testing Moses. What did Moses do? He reminded the Lord of what he had promised. Exodus 32, 13. Moses said, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your servants to whom you swear by your own self. And you said to them, I'll multiply your seeds as the star of heaven and all this land I've spoken of, I'll give it to your seed and they'll inherit forever. And the Lord repented of the evil that he thought to do to his people. Why? Because Moses conjured up the promises of God and presented them before the Lord. He wants you to learn to do the same thing. God's got a lot of promises in there and he wants you to take them and say, Lord, remember this? And God says, yeah, I remember, but I'm glad you reminded me. See how it works? God doesn't forget anything. But sometimes you've got to say, remember this? And then God acts because you're claiming his promise. I think the devil tries to cloud God's promises with our doubts. And when we say, Lord, I believe this, you said it and I believe it, then God can act upon it. He can activate his promises when we claim them. You need to present it to the Lord. 2 Samuel 7, verse 28. O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you promise this goodness to your servant. Now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever before you, Lord. O Lord God, you have spoken it, and with your blessing, let the house of your servant be blessed forever. David said, God, you promised to bless my house. I'm reminding you said it. Let it be established. I'm claiming it. I accept what you've said for my house. Did God honor David's promise? Or that promise he made to David? 
Yeah, not only did uh, he preserve his seed, even though Solomon sinned, when Solomon sinned, God said to him, look, because I made a promise to your father, I'm going to give you a tribe in Israel forever. And of course, Jesus came through the tribe of Judah. Jesus, the son of David, is going to reign forever and ever. And so God's promise to David that none would fail from his seed to sit on the throne forever is true. God's promise never fails. I like when God said to Elisha through Elijah, Elisha said, I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah said, you've asked a big thing. Here's how it works. And by the way, this is 2 Kings 2.10. If you see me, there's a conditional promise here. If you see me when I'm taken up from you, you'll receive a double portion of my spirit. But if you don't see me, you won't. So as they walked along and talked together, holy group of angels came down, fiery chariot took Elijah up to heaven, and the Bible says, and Elisha saw it. So when Elisha picked up the mantle of Elijah, he went back to the Jordan River. He claimed the promise of God. Sometimes you've wondered why he said this. Elisha said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had said this, he smote the waters and they parted. He basically says, where is that promise you made? You made me a promise, I'm claiming it now. And he did the same thing that Elijah did, and the waters parted for him just like they had parted for Elijah because he made a conditional promise, and Elisha met the conditions. He said, if you see me, in other words, if you don't take your eyes off me, you'll receive a double portion of my spirit. By the way, that's still true for you. Keep your eyes on Christ, and you'll receive a double portion. This was our memory verse. We're believing in the promises of eternal life. Believe this one. 2 Peter 1, 3, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. There's a promise right there. His power has given us how many things? All things that pertain to what? Life, for practical living, and godliness. Everything you need for godliness is in his word. Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Not just promises. Not just great promises. But exceeding great and precious promises. That's, can't get a better promise than that, can you? That by these, what do we do with these promises? By these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Whose nature is that? The nature of Christ. You can be a partaker of his nature. I don't know, Pastor Doug. Well, maybe you won't. Why? Because you don't believe it. If you believe it, you can. Do you believe his promise? By the promises, you got it right here, you can be a partaker of his divine nature. And some would say, well, that just means that God looks at you and he pretends you've got the nature of Christ. That's not what he's saying. He's saying you partake of it. You are changed having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Is that clear enough? You become a partaker of the divine nature and it's shown in that you escape the corruption that is in the world by lust. That's an exceeding great and precious promise all in itself that we can be new creatures. And then of course you've got what I quoted in Jude 1 24. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He is able to keep us from falling. That's why we used to sing that song at every evangelistic meeting. He's able, he's able. So you're not trusting in your ability. You're not trusting in your word or promises. You're trusting in his promises and his dependability. If you believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Yes, even your holy living. Everything is possible. How many believe it's possible for the devil to tempt you to sin? Let me see your hands. How many believe it's possible? You're not going to sin by, you believe it's possible for the devil to tempt you to sin. How many of you believe it's possible for Jesus to keep you from sin? If you don't raise your hand the second time, but you raised your hand the first time, that means you believe your devil is more powerful than your God. All things are possible for those that believe. I heard uh, somebody wrote one time, Robert Murray McShane, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear for a million enemies. Isn't that true? If you could right now, 
know that Jesus is in the next room and overhear him praying and interceding for you, would you be afraid of anything? How many of you would be more confident of your victory? Now I didn't finish the quote. Yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. He ever lives to make intercession for us. So just because he's a little further away and maybe you can't hear, do you believe he's praying for your victory? Then it can be yours. We need to cling to these promises that are here because it is a matter of life and death. The devil wants to break your hold on the promises of God. You've got to hold on to him as though your life depends on it because it does. Your eternal life depends on, your victory depends on, your success, your walking in his will all depends on your trusting his word, stepping out in faith, claiming his promises, knowing what they are. A lot of us don't even know the power of them and not letting go. Heard about a sea captain once recounted how he was making his way across the Caribbean to Cuba. They heard the shout, man overboard. The boat was frequently trailed by sharks that used to pick up the garbage that was thrown off the ship or discarded fish that they had eaten. And when a man fell overboard, it was a serious matter because those big lumbering ships couldn't turn around often in time to recover them if the water was cold or if there were sharks. And when they shouted man overboard, they always had a rope coiled up at the stern and they'd hurl it as fast as they could and you were supposed to get a hold of it before the ship got uh, too far away. Man overboard, seaman at the back, hurled the rope off the stern. The man who had fallen from the ship got a hold of it and he held on for dear life because the ship was still moving, so it's kind of like water skiing slowly, submarining through the water. He knew if he let go, Sharks would probably get him before that ship could turn around. And all the men got hold and they pulled him in, pulled him up the side, got him on board. And the captain said it was two hours before we could get his hands off the rope. He would not let go of that rope. <laughs> I remember one time riding a motorcycle for two hours in the rain and I couldn't open my hands up. And uh, they were just so cold they were frozen. But uh, that's the idea. You get a hold of the promises of God and don't let the devil discourage you and say, oh, you're not good enough. You're never going to make it. You can't make it. You can't believe it. What about all the times you failed? The devil's going to try and loosen your grip. Don't let go. The Bible says, cleave unto the Lord, for he is your life. A lot of unclaimed promises out there that uh, we're missing. Years ago, when the Canadian Pacific Railroad needed to take their train track across some Indian territory, the great Blackfoot chief by the name of Crowfoot gave him permission to cross their land. And in exchange, the Canadian Pacific Railroad gave him a lifetime pass to travel for free on that railroad. Well, he said he appreciated it. He coiled it up in a little scroll and stuck it in a leather pouch in a bag around his neck. But to their knowledge, for the remainder of his life, which was considerable, he never got on the train never took the ride that he could have taken. And that's the way it is sometimes with God's people. We just kind of carry it as a, an ornament. The promises of God, we wear them instead of live them. And God is wanting us to take the ride, to get on board, and to say, I personally am going to put my weight down on the promises of God. You can lean all you want on the promises of God. They will not break. Kind of like a story I heard one time about a man years ago needed to get across the Missouri River. It was in winter and he was making that pilgrimage with a lot of settlers across the river and uh, he came to the banks and it was frozen. He didn't know how thick the ice was and so he got down on all four. He figured if I spread out and displace my weight, if I walk, you know, the more concentrated weight, if I get on all fours. And so he's crawling across the ice Pretty hurt. soon he heard bells and he heard the crack of a whip and he looked to his left and there was a sleigh going across the river pulling a wagon filled with coal and horses galloping by him. And they looked at this man on all four crawling across the ice. And I wonder sometimes if that's not what the angels see. God's got these promises that have never failed and we're tiptoeing out there on the ice and we're getting down and and they're going, you know, it'll hold a lot more than you. Uh, the, the sacrifice of Jesus is adequate to keep the promises. 
It's better than any billion dollar government bailout, I'll tell you right now. There's enough for everybody. Uh, he, the blood is sufficient. His promises are sure, and you can set your weight down on them, friends. How many of you would like to become better acquainted with the promises of God this year that are found in His Word? You're going to have to read them. Start underlining them. Start claiming them. Ask, believe, and claim, and you'll experience transformation in your life, whatever your challenges are, whether it's something where you work, in your character, we've all got that, in your family. Pray for miracles. Don't underestimate what God can do. Amen? Amen. Is it easier to stand on one foot or two? Would you be more stable with two feet or four? Four. You got hundreds of feet you can stand on in the Word of God, friends. Amen. It's in the promises of His Word. You need to look at them, claim them, believe them, and you'll have that uh, solid assurance. Let's pray together. Loving Father, Lord, we thank You for the assurance that Your Word never fails, that not one word of all You've promised has failed and that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ does not change. Lord, I pray that we can have more confidence that you will fulfill what you've promised, that we will do our part to lay hold on those promises, those exceeding great and precious promises, that we might partake of the nature of Jesus himself in our lives, that we might escape the corruption that is in the world by lust, and reflect Christ and be real Christians. Help us, Lord, to get the specific promises that we need, not only for eternal life and the Holy Spirit, that you'll save our loved ones, but in the various areas of our lives where we struggle. Direct us to those promises that we need in your word. I pray that you'll bless these people in this church. Be with those in a special way who have come forward with some needs, some who may be accepting Jesus for the first time. Come into their hearts and give them that sweet assurance that they are your children. Also, Lord, we pray for the many who may be listening or watching and that your spirit will meet with them right where they are right now and they can experience that assurance, that peace of everlasting life that you promised in your word because of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray and we thank you. Amen. A website whose roots date back to the beginning of time, sabbathtruth.com is the definitive resource for Bible light on the Lord's Day. Clear Bible answers for every question you've ever had about the Sabbath. Seven key topic headings guide you through the purpose of the Sabbath, which day is the Lord's Day, the Sabbath and prophecy, questions about the Sabbath, how to keep it holy, the Sabbath and history, and many Sabbath resources. Visit sabbathtruth.com today and share your newfound treasure with a friend. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents. One location, so many possibilities. Amazingfacts.org.